Okay, well, let's uh, let's make a start. Uh, it's a couple of minutes past five here in the UK. So good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you joining us from the East Coast. And good evening to anyone joining us from Europe or stations further east. Thank you for joining this, the 18th of our regular series of seminars on pumping topics. Uh, this one will last about 30 minutes. Uh, allowing us plenty of time for a Q&A session after the presentation. So let me restart the, uh, the screen share. Okay, here we go. Uh, here is a listing of the previous short courses we've run during the last uh, year or so. If you've missed any of them, you can get a copy of the materials from our website, using the following link here, shortcourses.roarpumpen.com. Or you can go to roarpumpen.com and follow the link to RP Short Courses. You see here the list of topics we've covered. Now, this is a request to you all now, anything you would like me to cover in future sessions, please send me a note. You can uh, put it in the chat section of this, um, of this seminar or send me an, send me an email. Um, where are we? Here we go. If you go to uh, rawpumpen.com and follow the link to RP Short Courses, it takes you to this screen. And here is the link to RP Short Courses. If you click on that, it takes you here to this screen which you can also um, access from this URL, shortcourses.roarpumpen.com. You'll see all the courses linked, listed, and you can click on any one of them to see the course material. Well, here's what we're going to cover today. Overhung process pumps type OH1 and OH2, comparing and contrasting their features and uses and covering when is each the more appropriate course. Now, I had intended to cover the vertical overhung pumps, OH3, 4, 5, and 6 in this session as well, but I decided that it would be too much material for one session, and quite frankly, they deserve a session of their own. So that will be the next session in uh, three weeks' time. As usual, we'll be holding a Q&A session at the end. Um, please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions or make any comments. I'll address those that I can live at the end of the session and the rest will address by mail in the coming days. And if you want to suggest subjects that I can cover in future courses, use the chat facility to do that, please. We are recording this session and we'll make it available to all attendees as a, a YouTube link, as well as by emailing you all a PDF version of the slideshow and a Q&A summary from both of today's sessions. So what are the differences between an ANSI pump and an API pump? Well, here's the API definition of an OH1 pump. You'll see this note here that I've underlined. This type does not meet all the requirements of this international standard, and it refers you to Table 3. API lists in Table 3 the features that require special consideration before choosing this type of pump. Now, it only mentions two. The pressure rating, you'll note that all fully compliant API pumps shall be at least rated for 40 bar. Well, um, an ANSI pump doesn't get anywhere close to that. Uh, and the other thing is the casing support. You'll see that all API pumps should be centerline supported, um, whereas these, of course, are foot mounted. So it only mentions two things to think about. In my opinion, this grossly understates the case, as you'll see as we proceed with this presentation. 
And here is the API definition of an OH2 pump. And the next two slides so show a summary overview of the differences. First, API 610, heavy duty, centerline mounted, mechanically sealed pumps designed to fulfill the requirements of petroleum, petrochem, and LNG industries and all refinery applications. It's a very, it covers an awful lot of, uh, uh, of stuff in the API 610. It covers case design, material stress allowed, flange ratings, minimum should be 300 pound, <clears throat> piping design, material specifications, and it covers the material specifications of every component in a pump, not just uh, the case and cover. Bearing designs, bearing housing design, lubrication, wearing design, minimum clearances, mechanical design criteria, such as the API 682, it cross-references API 682, which is an integral part of API 610, and various other detailed requirements. By comparison, As ASME B73.1 or ANSI B73.1 is for horizontal end suction centrifugal pumps in chemical pump applications. And the emphasis is on low pressure ratings, you know, 18 bar at ambient temperature. Um, and also, and this is quite important, on meeting standardized dimensional limits to ensure that pumps within the same size group are dimensionally interchangeable. The idea is that you can change, interchange, um, swap out, for example, a Gould bare shaft pump for a flow serve pump, knowing it will fit seamlessly into the footprint and the performance will be very similar. So in a little more detail, what are the design differences? Well, pump design life, API 610 requires Minimum service life, life of 20 years and three years mean time between overhauls. ANSI B73.1 or ASME B73.1 doesn't have any specific requirements. They're long lasting rugged pumps, but no reference to requiring 20 years or three, uh, three years MTBO. Next major design difference is the interchangeable pump dimensional standards. ASME doesn't require it. it. You know, it doesn't require the Gould pump to be the same as the uh, as the raw pump and pump or the flow serve pump. But all ANSI pumps of the same size are interchangeable, and it, it lists the dimensions that it shall that that they shall meet. Similarly with the hydraulic head and flow, ANSI pumps, all pumps of the same size by different manufacturers should have similar flow and head um, capability. It lists, has a table which lists all the head and heads and flows for each of the pumps in, the, in the, that size uh, and lists the minimum continuous flows for all those ANSI pump sizes. You can't do this on an API pump. Uh, API pumps are engineered products and every one by every individual manufacturer is different. Next difference, the casing mount design. Very important for higher temperature pumps. API pumps are centerline mounted on their base plates. The casing expands on a high temperature pump. It allows the pump to, to expand 
upwards and downwards, keeping the center line the same. So keeping um, uh, uh, alignment of the of the pump good. Whereas with an ANSI pump, they're designed for, for ambient temperatures or low lowish temperatures. So the expansion in a vertical direction is not significant. Uh, if you try to use that in a hot service, you would very quickly uh, end up with alignment problems and mechanical seals leaking. It's a much broader scope, API 610. It covers 18 pump types instead of just one. And for material types, it covers 10, used to be 14, but it's now 10 combinations of pump construction. And it details the precise material for every pump component, right down to nuts, bolts, and washers. ANSI covers seven combinations of materials, but it also covers thermoplastic and thermosetting polymers pumps, which API 610 doesn't cover. I mentioned the API 610 material classes, um, and in 12th edition, this has been reduced to 10 sizes, uh, 10 material groups, classes, as opposed to in the 11th edition when it used to be 14. You'll see that all these four, which included cast iron components, have all been removed. And for ANSI pumps, these are the seven pump material classification codes. The last one being as specified, so it's whatever you want. This is where the plastic pumps uh, come in, or plastic coated pumps come in. Designed very much for uh, resistance to chemical attack, because these are being used in chemical plants, so pumping acids and alkalis, strong acids, strong alkalis, usually at lowish temperatures, but the material choice is important there. Now, a very important here point here, which should be mentioned in table three, but isn't, is allowable forces and moments. These are much higher in API 610 than they are in ANSI B73.1. This is very important as the API market does like to take a sensitive piece of rotating equipment and use it like a pipe anchor. God knows why, but that's what you guys do. So 11th and 12th edition, table five shows very high values of allowable forces and moments on the nozzles. And it also requires that the pump casing must be strong enough to withstand the following three factors at the same time. Twice the combined X, Y, Z nozzle loads and moments on both flanges applied simultaneously while at the same time withstanding the maximum allowable working pressure and temperature and operating without leakage. That's a tall ask um, and all API 610 pumps meet this requirement. An anti-pump will never meet that requirement. This is very important because you like to use it as a pipe anchor. So having defined these allowable forces and moments, um, you guys frequently like to double them and say that uh, the pumps must be suitable for two times forces and moments in operational um, uh, situations. So this is a very good reason why ANSI pumps are seldom going to be suitable for oil and gas refinery installations. Even for non-API water type services, typically, Oil company specifications for ANSI pumps tend to increase the forces and moments allowable in much the same way as they do for an API pump. Well, the next few slides are going to look at ANSI pump features, and I've extracted a few 
interesting slides from the Royal Pump and ANSI Pump presentation. I don't like to do a complete presentation of ANSI Pumps here. Um, it's not supposed to be, it's supposed to be an, um, not a product placement uh, thing, but an educational thing. So I've just taken some of the more important slides. So here is a typical ANSI Pump, foot mounted, a formed steel base plate, this one with a drain pan and a foot mounted motor. A common variation is the C frame adapter, which will allow you to use a NEMA C frame motor, a flange mo a NEMA C flange motor instead of a foot mounted motor. These are the typical applications and industries which would uh, use ANSI pumps. I would dispute oil and gas and pipeline if we're talking uh, um, oil pipeline duty. Um, an ANSI pump is seldom going to meet the extra requirements that oil company specs put on the pumps. The general features of an ANSI pump, this is of course the raw pump and offering, but the other major manufacturers are very similar um, by the very nature of uh, ANSI B73.1 specification, because the bare shaft pumps are designed to be interchangeable between manufacturers. So 31 sizes, I believe uh, ANSI actually has 27, but we've got a few more in the uh, in the raw pump and range. Similarly, the flows, ANSI goes up to 4,000 gallons a minute uh, and we're um, raw pump and is at uh, 7,000. So a few additional sizes there. Head and pressures up to 26 bar, um, flange ratings, 150, flat face is standard can have 300 pound, but you're still going to be restricted to that 26 bar. Bearing life, ANSI requires 17,500 hours. Um, Royal Pump have upgraded to 50,000 hours. Um, I'm not sure whether others have done likewise. I imagine they have. These are the materials that we routinely stock. Uh, we keep supposedly all our sizes, one of each of these sizes permanently in stock. So uh, for instant delivery. And these are materials that are available if you've got a little more time. Now, as we said earlier, the dimensions of the pump and the base plate are prescribed for the pump sizes within the standard. So any pump of any manufacturer is dimensionally and performance wise interchangeable with the same size pump from another supplier. Bearing lubrication, four options on this. Oil sump is standard. Uh, but you can have regreasable, greased for life, or oil mist. These are standard options. Many manufacturers of ANSI pumps, and Raw Pump is one of these, use semi enclosed impellers. These can be adjusted in service to allow for wear. That's the real advantage of these. Here is how. The axial clearance is adjusted. This bearing carrier is threaded into the housing and you can rotate it to displace the whole rotor axially, thus adjusting this gap between the impeller and the casing. So each rotation mark represents 0 0.003 three thou. Here you can see it a little more clearly. Here is the threaded bearing follower. 
and it's held by three bolts in position. You can loosen those and then rotate it by three thou at a time. Optional build is with a fully enclosed impeller with replaceable wearings. The pumps have three interchangeable stuffing boxes, and this is uh, quite normal amongst all suppliers. Um, one is used for packing and for simple cartridge seals. The big bore is used for dual seals and a tapered bore for solids handling. Here is the standard range chart. And you'll see Raw Pump and has three sizes of low flow pump that use a, a basky type radial vane impeller, low flow, high head. And there are various different varieties of base plate, which are specified in ANSI B73-1. Formed, formed steel one with non-metallic motor support feet. Same again with a drain pan under the pump. A drain rim type. And the same again with metallic motor mounting feet. And in this case, with horizontal motor alignment jack screws. And here is the big advantage of a standardized product line with warehouse stock holding. Same day or quick ship program for the standardized products. Pumps are stocked and therefore, I mean, I mean bare shaft pumps are stocked and therefore can be, uh, can be same day delivery. Um, and components are certainly stocked so that there's a good chance that you can get a quick ship pump in in less than a week. Now a few slides on the OH2 API compliant pump. Well, here are the industries in which they're frequently used. And as you can see from the photo here, they're a very different beast from the OH1. Compare this one with the previous slide. They're much simpler pump. Compared with a heavy duty API pump. Here are the uh, various features of an OH2. Uh, I've highlighted three that really make the difference between API and ANSI pumps. I'm not going to go through everything in, the, in this slide. You can do it at your leisure when you get the hard copy of this. But I would, the important points are here, the pressure casing is designed for 40 bar minimum with 300 pounds flanges as standard. 600 pound is optional, which fundamentally means that the casing is good for about 60 bar. Centerline support, suitable for high temperature operation and to accommodate higher forces and moments. And the third one is the shaft. Want to keep the shaft below 11 thou. It has a short, stubby shaft would be the best way of this describing it that will minimize the shaft deflection even at two times API forces and moments. We say it has a low L over D ratio, L over D, L cubed over D to the fourth, where L is the overhang of the um, impeller to the first bearing, that's the L, and D is the diameter of the shaft at that first bearing. By keeping that 
figure very low. It minimizes the shaft deflections, which leads to low seal leakage and long mechanical seal life, even at high forces and moments. At two times table five forces and moments is almost a normal requirement, even though it exceeds the literal requirements of API 610, it's frequently specified. So most manufacturers will be able to offer you two times forces and moments. From time to time, we're asked for three times and even four times. And that can often be achieved with finite element analysis. And in some cases, um, modifications to the pump casing and the base plate. So the modification is possible. Of course, it's expensive and pipe anchors are a lot cheaper. A couple of slides to illustrate how different an API pump is than an ANSI pump. This first one is a large pump with 10 by 8 inch nozzles. Notice the centerline support and the skid mounted auxiliary process piping. And even at the smaller sizes, this is a, an API pump with uh, two by four um, nozzles. You see the base plate extended to take all this auxiliary piping, this uh, plan 53 seal piping. This very different from the ANSI pump that we saw earlier. These are the uh, range coverage curves, and they will be very similar for all other suppliers as well, of course. Um, and as we will see in following curves, it's not, it's not a requirement of API 610, but you'll see that uh, uh, it works out that way to a certain extent. So at two pulse speed, 60 hertz, um, 40 gallons a minute, up to about 7,000, uh, 3,500 gallons a minute at two pole. And at four pole, 20 to 7,000 gallons a minute at, um, at four pole, 60 hertz. And what I was alluding to uh, just, just now, um, no requirement for AP, um, API pumps to have a similar performance curves or to be dimensionally interchangeable but the overall family curves are remarkably similar amongst all the major suppliers. For example, here is the flow serve range chart superimposed on the raw pump and one. Looks like flow serve has a pump out here that uh, raw pump and doesn't have, but by and large, the range is very, very similar. Same again for Sulza. And again for Goulds. I have similar slides for Gabionetta, Apollo, Anceval, and Finder, uh, and they all show very similar range coverage. Well, that pretty much concludes the fun for today. I just get to advertise the next of the short courses, coming attractions, 24th of November, that's uh, three weeks today. The second part of this short course on overhung process pumps, this time covering the vertical over pump, overhung pumps, OH3, 4, 5, and 6. Again, two sessions, one in the morning my time for the Eastern Hemisphere, and one as today for the Western Hemisphere, that's, that's you guys, in the afternoon my time. The invitation will be published nearer the time. Put it in your diary. So I'm going to leave this meeting open for a little while to allow you to post in the uh, Q&A box and I'll endeavor to answer those that only need a short answer here and now. Uh, those that need a fuller answer uh, will be answered 
within a few days. Anything you think of later, there's the where to write, info at shortcourses.rulepumpen.com. Our marketing team are standing by to direct your questions or suggestions to the best person to, uh, to handle them, which is probably me. If you need a certificate of completion um, for this short course, again, info at shortcourses.rulepumpen.com. And here, right at the end of the uh, presentation, are eight slides about Rural Pumpen that remind you of who we are and what we do. They'll be in the PDF copy of the presentation, so you can peruse them at your leisure. We needn't look at them now. We can get on with the Q&A. So let's have a look and see what we have in the Q&A. Carl Hoag has said, what duty is the API 610 pump service life based on? That would be based on its rated performance, um, which would of course be very close to um, the best efficiency flow and head because an API pump is always selected to be uh, with the rated point to be within uh, the 85 and 110% of best efficiency flow. But it's whatever is the guarantee point that you uh, that you as the customer have been given by the pump supplier. Anonymous attendee has said, what are the differences between the entire drain pan and the entire drain rim base plates? Um, well, the, the drain, the drain pan under the, under the pump, it's, uh, it depends. You see, on an ANSI pump, you'll get a drain pan just under the pump itself to catch any leakage from the pump. With um, uh, an API design, the full base plate acts as either a drain, drain pan or as a drain rim, and it's down to personal preference which you have, but either will allow, will catch any leakage within the confines of that base plate. Carl Hoag says again, is axial thrust force significant, and how is it resolved both these types of types of pumps? That's a nice question. Yes, and it's the same answer in in. Uh, both the thrust is balanced by having balance holes um, in the impellers, which equalize thrust across either side of the impeller. Um, for very high suction pressures, those balance holes might well be plugged. And for higher pressures, higher thrusts still, there will be different types of thrust bearing that can be fitted. Um, some manufacturers will have a, um, a triplex bearing instead of a double row bearing for these um, very high pressure, uh, very high thrusts pumps. More applicable on an API pump than it would be on an ANSI pump. You don't normally get high pressures on an ANSI pump. Anonymous attendee has said, do you recommend to use ANSI pumps to handle gasolines and diesel for storage terminal applications? Well, there's no reason why it can't. It's just that normally there were the specifications that will be applied on uh, uh, storage terminals uh, are likely to make it unlikely to be compliant. You're likely to be putting on um, requirements that an ANSI pump just can't meet. Forces of moments being um, being a big one of, of those, um, plus auxiliary piping, plus um, calling up API 682 seals. These are likely to be requirements of um, uh, storage terminal applications. But if they're not, no reason why you couldn't. If it's a low low temperature, lowish temperature transfer duty, um, no reason why it should, shouldn't shouldn't be uh, suitable. Anonymous attendee again. Certain PMCs set a limit on OH pump speed and maximum impeller diameter, but no such restrictions are imposed for BB2 pumps. Any thoughts on this point and why tip speed diameter shall be restricted? 
Um, might need to give this a little more thought. Um, I think it is the radial forces that would be um, found if you have if you run an overhung pump too fast. The radial forces of, the, of that overhung impeller will um, put a, 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 li a limitation on it, and that's why. Um, Two pole speed, you don't normally get much bigger than a 15 inch impeller at two pole speed. Whereas at um, with a between bearings pump where the radial forces are balanced and uh, you've got a bearing either side to reinforce it, you can go to much, uh, much larger sizes. Nikunj Palmer says, do you have high temperature pumps for 70 degrees centigrade for the recycling plant? Yes, yes. Um, Rural pump and does, and so would flow serve and salt serve and goulds as well. Gerard Nagel says for the three criteria for the API pump test, the last one stated no leakage. Is that from the mechanical seal or the gaskets? Both. Ali Al Fatal says, for a high temperature and severe chemical impact at the same time, what is our best option? Thank you. It was a great lecture. Well, thank you for your, that comment. Um, high temperature and severe chemical impact. Again, high temperature immediately you have to be API 610, and API 610 does have um, strong material options. It will allow you, for example, to have a duplex or a super duplex pump or 316 stainless. Um, those are standard materials within the API 610 um, remit. Craig Butler or Butler. Um, great presentation, Simon. Thank you. How does a hook style shaft sleeve affect L over D calculation? I need to, I need to look at look into that and I'll answer it uh, in the coming days on the uh, uh, when, when we send out the the answers I don't think it affects it but I will have to actually look at a drawing and uh, and, and be sure I know uh, Nikunj Palmer again are you also offering Hasteloy melted plastic pumps <laughs> I assume you mean a Hasteloy pump handling melted plastic. Um, I'm not quite sure what you what, what you mean there, uh, Nikonj. Perhaps you could uh, clarify um, that. Anonymous attendee says, why API 610 specifies minimum impeller wearing clearance and not the maximum impeller wearing clearances? Um, Okay, I've got it. Why it does that is to ensure that you don't use closed, tighter um, wearing clearances to increase the efficiency of the pump, which it will do for sure. But it says that's taking advantage. You need to keep this minimum clearance um, to uh, ensure good operation of the pump. Um, it will wear with time and those where those uh, clearances will open up and the efficiency will drop off and uh, you should be monitoring that to know when you need to overhaul the pump. But at the, the minimum is just to make sure that you're not taking advantage of using closer uh, running tolerances um, to get improved efficiency unfairly. Anonymous attendee, why overhung pumps are not recommended for flows exceeding a thousand cubic meters an hour? Um, you will have difficulty meeting the vibration requirements um, and um, yeah, fun fundamentally the, the pump will start to get, won't be reliable at the biggest speed because it's an overhung pump and the, and the, the, the loads are going up as you uh, as as you get higher and higher in the uh, in flow so at about those sort of um, flows that's when um, a bb2 pump becomes a better option
Okay, uh, as far as I can see is all the questions we've had so far. That appears to be it. So we can call it a day here. Um, so thank you again for attending today. I enjoyed preparing it and presenting it. I hope you found it useful. Um, look forward to seeing you on the 24th of November. So that's three weeks time for the, uh, the next short course, which will be of course on the vertical overhung pumps, OH three, four, five, and six. So beer o'clock for me, the rest of you better get back to work. Bye-bye.